this is so in, you know, I've, I've been doing the state of black Asheville with my, with my students at UNC Asheville since 2007, 2006, 2007 school year. And um, this is the first time I've ever tried to do it virtually without my students. And it's, um, it's, I, I'm so thoroughly intimidated. It just is unbelievable. I can't believe as an introvert, I found myself in this position. But anyway, we're going to get through it. And this is the 2021 report. And instead of students having generated the data and taking the credit for a work well done, um, I, I have a list of people that I want to acknowledge in terms of where these slides came from, where the data came from, uh, the cooperation and support I've gotten, uh, particularly even through the pandemic, uh, meeting virtually with people, as they told me that despite my supposed retirement, the need for the state of Black Asheville was still very much present with us. Um, you know, really one of the people, and I, I will go through this list really quickly, and you should consider it sort of a bibliography um, for this presentation. And these are the sources. Um, and one I, I, I highly recommend um, is uh, the publisher and editor of the uh, Urban News, uh, Johnny Grant. Um, I've also used reports by uh, Dee Williams. Uh, she contributed uh, information on ho um, home mortgages and, and local financial institutions. Um, this past Friday, uh, this was uh, December the 10th, um, the Dogwood Health Trust um, released a report that was it's called the Bowen Report. And the Bowen Report is online. You can go through Dogwood Health Trust's website. And what it's doing is a supplement and a parallel view of, of, the, ninth, of the 2020 census in terms of housing and the migration of people. Um, it was very useful. Um, most, but I think most useful for this report uh, came from the UNCA campus. Um, particularly, um, it, it, it worked through the uh, present uh, research projects for undergraduates done by Kathleen Lawler. Uh, Dr. Lawler is uh, looking at urban renewal. And along with Dr. Lawler's uh, data collection, I would recommend the narrative that's provided by Priscilla Robinson through a website um, that's called the Urban Renewal Impact, and it's urbanrenewalimpact.org. Uh, a couple of other things on this bibliography I'm giving you is that um, the city of Asheville and the county, Buncombe County, have committed themselves to public accessible, publicly accessible data. Uh, their IT department under Eric, with Eric Jackson and, and Cameron Henshaw have been really instrumental in some of the data that you'll see here. Um, also, Urban 3, um, as a new institute, and fairly new institute, data generation, looking at property taxation um, was useful, um, along with the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department. Um, the city council, Asheville City Council and the Buncombe County Commissioners are doing something that um, they haven't done very frequently, and that they're working together to deal with reparations. They both pass reparations uh, resolutions. And uh, the county manager and the city manager, Avery Pendrel and uh, Deborah Campbell, have committed themselves to data-based approaches to uh, uh, confronting the, the past, the racial past of this, of, of this area. And um, they've been very supportive along with the Justice, Racial Justice Coalition in uh, providing support and direction um, and, and, and honestly, when you're dealing with the, our community, it all is not collected in numbers and it's all not necessarily just through the personal experiences or narratives uh, that I've run across. It's also through longstanding institutions willing to open their doors to me and to the issues that are coming from the state of Black Asheville, particularly back the Black churches. Um, uh, it, I have a list. I mean, they, they've invited me, I mean, of all people, to come into the pulpit to talk to congregations in the community about um, what's going on with our children and with ourselves and with our seniors in, in, in Asheville and Buckingham County. Um, and that includes Hill Street, it includes um, Tridestone, it includes uh, um, Rock Hill, it, in, it includes uh, Nazareth and Mount Zion, uh, the Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, the, the New Mount Olive. These, these are churches that have demonstrated over and over and over again their willingness to, to engage social justice at a spiritual level. And I, I appreciate that. Um, 
And on the other end of the scale, there's an, there are archives with the PAC Library and with uh, UNC Special Collections that we can use as evidence that further supports the need for this kind of research to happen annually. And, and I'm, I'm sure it will. And there's so many other people that I know I did not, uh, uh, I did, no, I did not mention. And it's not because they're not important, but I just wanted to get through and begin looking at the state of Black Asheville. Um, and I thought I'd start off with uh, the uh, population changes, the demographics. And this one slide is enough to, to kind of tell the story of what's happened over the last 20 years in Asheville, is that um, something is going on with population growth. I mean, you can tell by the traffic, you can tell by the, the, the patterns of housing that's going, that are going on, the numbers of new buildings that are being constructed. Um, but when you look at things through the lens of race, it often takes on a different uh, characteristic. And that really what we have here is when we first, when, when Dolly and I, were, when my wife and I first came to Asheville, about 17, 18% of the population of the city was African-American. And I tend to use Black and African-American interchangeably. Um, um, uh, in an academic sense, I use Black as an inclusive global term of reference to include Africa and the Caribbean, et cetera. Um, in America, I find that it's comfort levels that matter whether I choose to use Black or African American. And with Asheville, I have found that using both, it depends on our audience. And so I'm going to use both in this presentation. But with the population we first came here, it being at 17, 18%, um, by the turn of the century, by the 2000 uh, census, it had dropped to 13.4%. Um, this 2020 census, we are now at 10.7% of the city being African American. And so we have to ask, what is going on? Is the population growing at a degree that is just um, at, a, at a greater pace than African Americans? And what you see from this slide is that that is the case, that we do have tremendous growth happening in the city and in the county. And the projections indicate that it will continue for the next 20 to 30 years as we pick up uh, citizens from uh, that are basically climate refugees. They're looking for a place to live without being swept away by hurricanes or wildfires or floods. Asheville is a perfect place for that. We can expect our population to, to grow significantly over the next 10, 20 to 30 years. I've, I've seen projections to go from now, we have a total of 96, 97,000 people in the city. Uh, I've seen projections that place us in 20 years at 150,000. I've seen projections that place us in uh, by 2040, 2050, next 30 years, um, closer, closing in on 175, two, uh, 200,000. That's hard to imagine. That's, that's hard to imagine. But when we talk about race, that's not what we are experiencing. African-Americans are leaving the city and they are not necessarily relocating into the county. They're leaving the region. And tonight I wanna to talk about maybe some reasons why they would leave, why uh, black folk would leave the region. Let's, let's look at education first. Um, just to remind you of Stevens Lee High School, um, Castle on the Hill. I'm not an alum, but I've known so many. And um, during the pandemic in, in uh, 2020 and even through 2021, um, this uh, tremendous group of alumni have lost many of, their, of, of the members. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm just thinking of Oil Cheryl, Pat Griffith, and several others who are no longer with us, but were considered, they were our elders in the community. Um, and their loss doesn't mean the loss of our momentum because actually, this is what's happening now. And it's completely in the legacy of the Stevens Lee High School is that we have Peak Academy. It's a charter high school, a charter elementary school. Uh, we started at K one and two. Next year will be grade three and we'll take it all the way to grade eight. And basically our mission is designed, is, is, is several fold, but there are two major aspects I wanna point out to you in that um, we are committed through charter and through mission to address disparities in academic performances and outcomes. And so we named ourselves Peak Academy, uh, preparing, empowering, achieving through knowledge. Um, and the second thing I wanna, I wanna point out to you is that about the Peak Academy is that 
we are the only charter in the state of North Carolina whose mission it is to uh, close the disparities. That, and we, are, we are on center stage here. You know, there is no doubt that what we're doing will be copied if it is successful throughout the state, because this is not just an actual problem. This is a statewide, if not national problem. And we will do so by clearly addressing uh, it through 50% of the staff and faculty, 50% of our student body will be children of color or people of color. Um, there's no mistake about why we are here and what we intend to do. Um, because what we're doing, um, if, you, if you go to this website, the North Carolina Department of Public Instructions, DPI, you'll see the reports um, um, that characterize every school system in the state of North Carolina. This particular address will take you directly to Asheville City Schools. And instead of with other states of Black Asheville, my students, when I was teaching, um, this was one of, their, one of the topics that they found most interesting is that to go into the Department of Public Instruction and to look at end of course, end of grade exam results and to look at them through gender and through race, the lenses of gender and through race. And those, those disparities, those differences in outcomes have uh, spurred report after report and reform after reform. And I can never be more proud, uh, never be prouder of my students than, the, the, than to provide a database from which to implement, or to formulate and implement new policies. But with the pandemic, when you go to this website, you won't see end of course, end of grade exam results. Things were put on hold. Um, and in terms of it, the disruption of the school year that it caused. But this is what it did not do. And so it, 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 during the pandemic, we see graduation rates that reflected pretty much by race, what they've always reflected, that African-Americans are only slightly behind uh, whites in terms of actual graduating from Asheville High and, and Silsa. However, when we look at um, the uh, overall performance of the Asheville City Schools, what I directed my students to do was to look at the terms under which the federal government through the judiciary, the federal courts were looking at the desegregation and the successful uh, uh, merging of the black and the white systems here locally. They laid out, the court was, was clear about laying out five areas that they wanted to see um, equity. It was the educational outcomes, we were looking at uh, discipline. We looked at the hiring and retention of faculty and staff. They looked at dropout rates. They looked at graduation rates. And those things were very crucial. All those areas are very crucial in determining whether or not this would be a unified system, which it was never declared by the federal courts, away from the dual system that characterized seg a segregation. And so one of the areas I thought I'd present to you tonight is the, is, is the area of discipline. Since uh, the academic performances were so disrupted by the pandemic, it felt as though we, we were piling on, uh, adding to troubles. You know, but that's, let's look at referrals instead. And what you see here are that 41% of the referrals are black, 33% are white, 27% multiracial. And you say, what do I have to compare that to? Well, before the pandemic, Asheville City Schools and Mecklenburg Schools were under federal uh, um, observation for a while, and the feds decided to go towards Mecklenburg as opposed to Asheville City Schools because we were having upward of 75% of referrals um, being represented by African-American students. And let, let, me, let me repeat that. 75% of African-American students, 75% of African-American students at some point were receiving in-school or out-of-school suspension. They're being written up by teachers and sent to the office or, or off campus. This looks like it's a tremendous uh, um, um, improvement over the 75%. However, it, it, before the pandemic, reports were given it by race, by black and white. This report, which represents how reports will be coming out in the future, is done by black, white, and multiracial. What it does not say are what, by what race are multiracial identifying. And so if we, if we look at multiracial as being a way of also looking at 
another component of our Black community, we find that we have not improved very much in terms of the racial distinctions of re referrals. We're back up to the 68, nearly 70% of uh, those referrals being students of color. And so this is, this is problematic, along with another percentage compared to our percent in the school district. And so here we are in the Asheville City School System with 41% of African-American students. Um, here you can see the cursor here. And then you're looking at 11% in the actual total population. We have multiracial representing 27%, but actually 2% of the total population. And then we have white students receiving 33% of referrals versus 84% of the total population. Um, this disproportionality um, needs to be addressed. And one of the ways we might address it is by looking at the percent of uh, black administrators, teachers and staff in national city schools. This was another area that was supervised by the federal courts uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, and then through the early 80s, as they sought to end the era of Jim Crow segregation in the schools. Um, um, but when we look at the percentage in the 2021 school year, we find that black administrators in the Asheville City Schools represented 1.25%. Black teachers were 4.3%. Black staff, 155 Now, you, you, you see, when we look at it compared to percentage of population, it's at 12. We are, we are far away, far and away from being equitable there. Um, one of the disciplinary issues uh, that confront our children may be found in who's actually doing the disciplining. We're going to um, housing. Before we begin on housing, though, let me, let me, let me say one thing about teachers and, and staff and principals, is that um, in working with PEAK, we have discovered that, um, and as well as, uh, I think this is nationwide, that the pay for teachers and administrators is completely inadequate for the kinds of issues that we're confronted with in each of the schools. Um, um, to raise their pay is to significantly increase the, 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 the retention of our, of our faculty and staff as we confront equity, racial equity in our schools. And when I say increase, and I'm not talking about making them competitive with Target or Walmart, I'm talking about paying them for, as the professionals that they actually are. Um, um, and, I, and I think that that's, that should be a major objective for um, 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 the future for the Asheville City Schools and Bunker County Schools. But let's look at housing. And this is where I'd like to focus attention tonight is, is, is a, a great deal on housing. Um, with housing, um, we're finding that houselessness, or I, I should have said houselessness, that the population is 125. And these, 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 methodolo these are methodological problem areas is that it's hard to replicate. We actually take snapshots of local areas to determine how many people are experiencing uh, homelessness. We find that um, in, the, in the homeless population that 27.4%, 24% are black, while 70% are white. And um, this represents a very disproportionate uh, population in terms of by race. Um, if we are if we are ten point seven percent of the city's population, we we are um, through this snapshot um, representing nearly twenty four percent of those who are homeless. And so, when we look at um, um, housing as an area of the state, the state of Black Asheville, and we compare owner and rental occupied housing by race, this first column here represents those who are uh, the percent of owners of housing units. And this is representing the percent of renters of housing units. So, of all the housing in Asheville, 95.5% is occupied by whites, and we're talking 2.4% occupied by black folk. Black folk own 2.4% of the housing in Asheville. In terms of rent, again, remember we're 10.7% of the population, and we're looking at 8.3% of the rentals available in Asheville are going to um, black folk. We can see it again through these bar graphs that we can compare the rental population to the overall population, 
we are somewhat skewed. But when we look at owner-occupied housing, we are very skewed. So 2.4% of the um, housing being occupied by African-Americans. And that's only the tip of the iceberg when we start talking about housing. And this is one of the things, this is, in, in this photograph is one of a series of photographs that was taken as we address urban renewal as one of the reasons why owner, owner, um, home ownership is so skewed. Um, if you take a quick look, you'll see this house and you see this, 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 this man, this white man, nice tie, holding up a chalkboard. And these kids are just looking, you know, the children are just out playing and they're just looking. He is actually documenting homes that are to be raised, that are to be torn down. And these, these children have no idea that that's, what he's, that's what's actually going on. And so as we look at urban renewal in Asheville, these are the, the dates generated by Dr. Lawler's class um, at UNCA that um, uh, the years of these projects. But you can see that many, that the projects are beginning in 65 and 69 and 1970 being the height of urban renewal in Asheville, uh, but continuing with monies that are still identified as urban renewal as late as the 1990s. During the, those early 60s and, and, and uh, during the, the 1960s, 1970s and 80s, we're, we're, the, when, when people were dislocated, um, um, offers were made. Homeowners were given compensation and supplements that could range up to $15,000. Uh, renters were often given some support, but not enough to make it really useful. Um, and so you're talking about um, homeowners uh, needing to replace housing once the area had been raised and torn down to rebuild was costing generally $10,000 to $15,000 more than what you could have realized at maximum um, um, when, you're, when you were located, when you're, you were compensated for your home. Um, rental assistance, the same thing, uh, only 43 residents and they were being, the average rent at the time was $97. Um, replacement dwelling average rent was $192. Now, where's that hundred dollars coming from for the rest of the rent? Um, and, and, and we're talking about amount needed to bridge the four years and then the average payment being far below that. In other words, the promise of, of urban renewal was coupled with the promise from the federal government of model cities. And so urban renewal and model cities, urban renewal was this, was this removing of urban blight and model cities was the replacement with brand new houses and infrastructure and, 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 and residences and business, for businesses. And so we were looking at, you know, this is a good deal. For a few years of dislocation, we can move back into a brand new neighborhood. Of course, that never happened. And so, and the economic impacts are what's so interesting um, that are being assessed now. How do you, what, you know, you often say, how do you place a value on segregation? Do you place a value on urban renewal? Well, the valuations of loss and damages of black wealth can actually be done through the loss of financial capital, we have degraded social capital, diluted political capital, and weakened uh, human capital. Those can be monetized. And that's where they are in the project today on campus, monetizing urban renewal and its losses to the African-American community. In terms of the city's acquisitions, uh, they find, the students found that 394 properties have been acquired, um, including 269 lots. Um, it's my understanding that many of the lots were acquired through eminent domain, um, church, schools, uh, fourth stores. Um, these, were, it's, those, these were city acquisitions. Um, 119 residents were, were required, 53 owner-occupied, 41 tenant-occupied, 25 unoccupied. Um, as we go through the appraisals and compensations, and this is for owner-occupied, uh, properties, uh, the mean appraisal was right around $8,500. The average compensation, $9,970. Supplemental payments were $13,000. However, 
to replace the home that had been re- had been torn down, you needed twenty seven point seven thousand. Now, to qualify for that, to get that money to rebuild your home, you had to go to financial institutions that in turn were looking at, uh, you were looking at mortgage payments and mortgage loans. So how generous were the mortgage institutions in providing mortgage payments to people who had been displaced in uh, the various areas? Now, I, I say that as a precursor to this, and these are series of maps that were, that were affected by urban renewal. And it's not that I want you to locate your place in this map. That's not the point of this map. The point of this map is actually the small writing here. This is a collection, again, done uh, through uh, uh, research facilities at UNCA. Homes and businesses and churches and schools that were affected within those urban renewal areas in this part of town. And so you see grocery stores, hospitals, you see beauty shops and barber shops, churches, and of course, a number of homes and, and neighborhood centers. Monfort was affected. South Side. Look at the number of businesses or churches that are no, that that some of, most of which are no longer with us. So when we're talking about urban renewal, we're not just talking about the the, the, the modernization of a, of a part of town and it's removing the blight and then the replacement of it with brand new shiny things. You can't really, you can't really replace a community like that. You, you disrupt relations. You, you end historic kinds of settings. You change the very physicality of who and where you are from. And that is something that these maps help us to understand the cost of African-Americans of living in Asheville. Look at East End. Look at the number of churches. Many of whom you say, oh, well, these churches are still there. Look at what it did to, for lack of a better word, look at what it did to the parish of these churches. Look at where the people who congregate, who are the congregations of these churches, they lived someplace. So maybe the church wasn't burned, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't torn down, but the very homes of the congregants were. And so today we look at churches closing or being very, very poorly attended because the neighborhoods within which they sat no longer exist. The Savoy Hotel, oh my, remember that. We had to turn that one into a police parking lot across the street from the YMI and so forth and so forth. Roland's Jewelry. And I wasn't even here, y'all. This is not even my, this is not even my personal history. This, this, is, this is the history of Asheville. But Rollins was the secret place that ACE Corps, the, 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 the Asheville Student Committee on Racial Equality, ACE Corps met Mr. Rowland in his store and organized in order to desegregate downtown and desegregate the schools. This was the meeting place, which is it's a historic area. It's no longer there. And of course, the clubs and the restaurants the barber shops, the, the stores, they're, they're all gone, all are gone. The Burton Street. Burton Street is still being attacked by the Department of Transportation for this grand state of North Carolina. And despite its history, despite its historic nature as being it, 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 at the turn of the century, of, uh, one of the premier agricultural communities, but it was also a cultural center for African-Americans. E.W. Pearson is still celebrated annually um, at the Burden Street Center. Now, this, this map, the location of uh, Black folk and, and populations um, in the city, um, it, you don't have to memorize it. Again, you can go back to this, but just to give you a feel, what I want you to begin looking at here when we, as we talk about housing and the state of Black Asheville, you see this cursor, you see how it, it, it's a little V here. Well, let me, let me say this to you. This is um, north to south, west to east. And of course, this is 40. And you, the end of a highway runs right through it. And if we look closely, you're going to see um, this southeast quadrant of the city that looks blank. 
There ain't no black folk there. Isn't that amazing? Look, it must be a it must be a huge lake there or something. Maybe it, maybe it's a, it's it's some something natural that we're all looking at. No, this is the this this is the southern side of the Biltmore Estate historically, and in the 1920s it was it was turned into a township of Biltmore Forest, in which it became it was separated from Asheville City as as it stands today. But the reason why I bring this up under housing is not is, is for a couple of reasons. One is that the African Americans who lived here were dislocated. They were bought, sometimes coerced, but definitely moved to the western side of Hendersonville Highway today into what we know as Shiloh. But this side here declared itself independent and free as it <laughs> built more force township. Um, a second reason why we see this as being interesting black folk are here is because of that. Now, I know you can't see it, I know, but I, this yellow part right here helps to explain why black folk were not necessarily in all parts of the city. And it says, let me read it to you, no part of the property described above, this is a deed for, in 1925, the property in Montford, but no part of the property described above or any interest therein shall be sold, leased, or otherwise disposed of to any Negro or any persons, firm, or corporation for the use of any Negro. These are this 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 covenant, this this restrictive covenant was outlawed, it was declared unconstitutional in 1948 by the US Supreme Court. However, the restrictive covenants continue to appear and to be enforced. Um, um, those to be enforced uh, throughout the entire country. And the restrictive covenants yielded the map that you see today because Biltmore Forest did not sell, buy, lease, or otherwise have a building that's for the use of any Negro. Even today, that population is virtually zero. You see, the, what we inherit from the past is, with, is still with us. And so we just can't say, well, let bygones be bygones and let's move on. We are the products of history. Even looking at the location on this map that you see in front of you of where public housing is. You see Pisgah View, Deaver View, Hillcrest, Klondike, Lee Walker Heights and so forth. Again, if you, if rough, you can see the V. You say, what is this V thing happening? What is this V thing happening? Again, you can see the V. Can you see it? From Stumptown and Hill Street through South Side, this is an aerial map and through East End, and the V is this. This is the V of redlining. There you go. This was the area that was designated by the federal government all over the country. They mapped urban areas, they mapped cities to, um, uh, to talk about areas that were prime importance to areas that were of least value. Those areas that were least value or red line was drawn around them. And they tended, they were almost universally the areas on which um, African Americans lived. Um, sometimes you would see poor whites clump depending on where you were in the South or in the Ozarks. But the, the, and for Asheville, this is, all, this is the segregated community. Now what that meant was that financial institutions did not necessarily have um, um, uh, the reason to give any prime rates because you were being rated as very low by the federal government for investment and for real estate values. Uh, taxes were uh, levied on appro in appropriately in terms of this is the least valuable land available. This red line tended to be the places where we located the interstates interstate highway system, or we, inter or, or we would put uh, dumps, you know, where we'd pick our trash. This would be where industry would be located, railroads. Um, today, we might see, in fact, there's a paper done by one of our students at Asheville, UNC Asheville, that indicated that the city's primary brown zones, these, these environmental hotspots, are located mostly in, within the redlined areas. 
Um, and, and even today, we still suffer from, this is, this is done by Urban 3, we still suffer from that V effect. Because what's happening now is that because Asheville is prime territory in which you know, homeowners are seeking residence, well, it might fit the, the wallets of, of homeowners to live in places that the property values were low. And so why not, let's, let's, let's integrate. Let's, let's have a multicultural community. Let's, let's add to diversity. And in doing so though, you build a new house or you, or you improve this house or it causes the dynamics of the market to kick in that allow for this house to now be taxed at a rate that causes its neighbor's taxes to also go up. Um, and so we have an actual disproportionality of tax over areas that had declared themselves free from being in the city of Asheville. And so we have lower uh, uh, tax rates increasing at a lower rate uh, uh, than we do in areas in which the houses have been once deemed to be less desirable. Now what that means, what, what part of what this means is that we're, we're talking not just dislocation, but we're talking about the idea that housing in, in Asheville is that the property taxes in Asheville, they appear to be progressive. And so the more valuable your house, the more taxes you pay. That's what it means by being progressive tax is that, you know, you're paying in accordance to the amount that it, it's, 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 it's been assessed for. However, it's, this is a hidden kind of way of dealing with the state of black Asheville and, 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 and if you if you if you begin looking at rather than the property and market determining the value, if you look at the actual income of the owners of the homes, you find that property taxes are terribly regressive. In other words, the poorest pay the more pay more in taxes proportionally to their income than the wealthier. And so the, on, on, on the face of it, it looks progressive. In reality, they are regressive. And if you think this is not a matter of, of importance, I, I point you towards Hilton Head Island. I point you towards the Sea Islands in South Carolina um, and a number of other areas is that these were areas often that were used um, um, as former plantations. Um, sea Island cotton grew really well in Hilton Head. Um, its quality was often compared favorably to Egyptian cotton. And at the end of the Civil War, Hilton Head was primarily occupied by the folk who had been enslaved on that island. And they cultivated and they prospered until it was found that those island, those, those, that island plantation made a wonderful golf course. And so the gentrification began and wealthy moved in, property taxes went up, the people who lived there couldn't afford the property taxes and they were moved out. And now I want you to find me all the black folk who lived in Hilton Head Island because they are no longer on the island. They've been moved away. If you think that can't happen to Asheville because we're too progressive and we won't let that happen, think again, think again. We're very much on that track. And how it affects the state of Black Asheville explains our very first slide when we saw the population in decline. And rather than take financial hits, people are opting to leave. And this is one of the primary reasons, gentrification. If you look at homes that are, that, that are owned, this, this section here might be a little difficult to read. At the bottom of it are home values, and it goes from uh, less than 10,000 to over $1 million. And the blue bars are white people who own the homes. The green bars are black people who own the homes. And the homes that are of lesser value are predominantly owned by African-Americans. The homes of greater value are owned by whites. And these, 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 these slides um, are geniusly done and I appreciate Urban 3 for providing them. But let's look at what makes these taxes re regressive. Let's look at the income. Now in 2017, um, I was asked to do a presentation on the state of Black Asheville to Buncombe County Commissioners. And I, I applaud them, uh, uh, um, Ellen Frost and uh, uh, Al Whitesides and uh, uh, the, 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 
all the, the mission, the, the people there the, the, uh, on the commission, um, those two particularly approached me about doing this and were very closely with me on this. And I, I, I appreciate their efforts because it had been 10 years of doing student research, supervising student research projects with State of Black Astral, and no one in the government had ever bothered to talk to me about it. <laughs> the reports were there, but you know, officially didn't mean anything. And then in 2017, reports were done um, and presented to the, uh, to the county commission. And this was one of the slides that was presented in 2017 and it's average monthly earnings. And we find that in average monthly earnings, when we look at economic mobility as another area for the state of Black Asheville to investigate, we find that there was a gap of nearly $1,000 a month in earnings between Black and white people, not the Black and white workers in Asheville. And so what might that look like today? These are the monthly earnings in 2020 as collected by the IT department of the city of Asheville. Um, Cameron uh, Henshaw and Eric Jackson helped me uh, and were very generous with their time in providing this, these, these data. And if you look closely, what you'll find is that the information they provided at, in 2015, compared to 2015, we see 2324, $2,324 being earned by black workers for 2020, we find $2,252 being paid for Black workers. And what that means is that in the course of nearly five years, we have actually had a decline in earnings for Black people, while simultaneously looking at an increase in the monthly earnings for white employers. You see whites at $3,459, and we find $3,600. And so between the 2015 and 2020, we're looking at um, an increase. The difference is um, not $980. We're finding a difference in white and black workers of $1,356 a month. Yes, this is why when we're looking at taxation, property taxation, we're looking at it being more aggressive because workers are actually earning less now than they have been. Um, and the same, and, and it goes on to talk about um, in 2015, where folk were being paid. And this was in 2015. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the numbers for 2020, 2021, but these are the primary economic sectors of the local economy. Um, restaurants, accommodations, education, nursing care facilities, uh, administrative services, building tra contractors, hospitals, professional scientific and tech services, and laboratory uh, health care. And in every major economic sector, we find for black and for white workers, significant wage differences, monthly earnings. This is discrimination. This is prohibited by the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is, this is in violation of the law that ended Jim Crow. This was the reason why the schools were under supervision for so long by the courts. Well, they never put the private sector under supervision. And, you know, I, I asked a group the other day, exactly who do you report this to? Suppose I want to say federal law is being broken. Who do I report this to? Who investigates? Who gets cuffed and does the perp walk? Who's denied bond? And so we, 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 it, who's jailed for this? Flagrant breaking of the law that results in profound community harm. And look at some of the results, the mean income over the past 12 months. For black and for whites, we're talking double. Black folk earning half of what white folks earn is a mean income. The households receiving food stamps or SNAP benefits, those are the raw numbers, 1,400, nearly 1,500 black people receiving, households receiving it, while uh, over 12,500, nearly 12,600 white, white households. And here are the percents. And so we look at 10% of the African-American, 10.2% of the African-American community receiving SNAP while representing 
this part of the total population at the time. And look at the results of discriminatory wages. Look at, look at what happens when we aren't paid what we should be being paid. It results in nearly 25%, nearly a quarter of the population living uh, below the poverty line. It's even higher if we just look at children. Unemployment rates. Now, generally in Asheville um, and historically nationally, if you look at white unemployment rates in Dublin, the overall unemployment rates in Dublin, you, that's what usually someplace either there between whites and overall, you'll find the uh, population that is unemployed for African Americans. In Asheville, it's tended to be, um, it, it tends to follow the same route, two to three times as, as high um, in terms of the unemployment rate for um, black folk as it is for whites. And this, this is despite labor force participation, that we have 60, 60 or nearly 62% of the labor force that should be working, actually working. People are looking for jobs. They just aren't being paid. And now healthcare. I thought this was significant. Dr. West, Sharon West, um, um, was the one who, who basically let me understand the history of where the colored hospitals were in several locations, and this was one, but it's gone. It's now um, a parking lot for Green Man Brewery. Um, they promised that they would put a sign up to let them let people know that's what was there, but they haven't even put the sign up. This one was surprising in terms of health care. The percentage of disabled in Asheville, 61% of those who are disabled in Asheville are black. Yes, the stress, stress takes a toll. Harsh living, it, it takes a toll. Um, infant mortality. And it, when you talk to medical professionals, um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, you could get an argument about it's not clinically demonstrated that stress has a physiological effect. It was, it was considered to have a psychological effect and that, it, yes, it could be contributing to, to towards depression or to his uh, uh, behaviors that are unsociable. But the point being is that we haven't really demonstrated as a physiological effect. It doesn't really harm your body. It just, it, 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 it changes your mood. And no, now we know differently. And we can see it through the mortality rates of infants and children in our community. This is the mortal, infant mortality rate in Morgan County over the last four years. This is the infant death rate, under one per thousand in Buncombe County. The infant death rate for those under one per thousand in Buncombe County. 15.1% for 15.1 per thousand versus 3.8 per 1,000. This is a teen pregnancy rate per 1,000. This is, and, and when we look at teen pregnancy, when we look at infant mortality, when we look at uh, preterm births, premature births, we look at preterm births, we're looking at the results of stress. We're looking at the results of inadequate reproductive care. And perinatal. It doesn't matter what stage, the, the fetus, the infant, the, the, the developing baby, the baby, the child, we're still looking at, it's a tough life living in Asheville. Low birth weights, 15% of our children born below birth weight. And you say, maybe you should go to the doctor. Well, we are going to the doctor. And so we have to say, what, is, what kind of medical care are we receiving? We're covered. Nearly 90% of us have some type of insurance. Look at the numbers of physicians. Look at our physician demographics in Buncombe County. You know, it, it, we're talking about, for physicians, looking at in the county, 1.9%, 1.94% of all physicians are black versus 6.3% of the county's population being black. You say it shouldn't matter, but it does matter. It does matter. Medical care, 
the idea of, of being culturally congruent, the idea of being able to see into a home and to say properly what kind of physical care is needed um, is all part of what it takes to be a good physician and an attending physician. So access might be one thing, but confidence in your physician is another. You know, in, in terms of drug overdoses, I was asked this the other, the other day, um, and it turned out that uh, Zope and POFU, they're working with uh, the Health and Human Services Department, um, have been able to generate um, this medication or drug overdose uh, information for Buncombe County um, in that it's not, these are not, uh, the, the ODs are not all black folk. That we're looking at the vast majority of old overdoses being white. Justice, I'm getting on with time. So I'm just gonna go through this very quickly because I leave a little bit of time for question and answers. But one of the things that it was very difficult for the state of black Asheville students and the undergraduates was to get information on from the Asheville Police Department. Um, not, not forthcoming at all. Um, here recently, though, with the help of uh, Deborah Campbell, the actual city manager, um, with support from city council, we were able to get the demographics for the first time in a state of Black actual report of the officers um, for APD. And we look at 4.9% um, being female, 7.1% being male, being African-American, even though we represent more. And this is just a different, and this is the result. This is what I wanted to get to is this, the traffic stops. You, you know, you want to make a connection and it, it should take more research. And I'm, I'm hoping we can do that research at some point that officers, it, it matters um, the person driving and the officer who is stopping um, because we see that despite being only 11% of the population, actually less than 11% of the population, and we represent 21% of traffic stops. And if you do this by gender, it's even more skewed. And once we are stopped, once, once, once the stop occurs, 43% um, of, the, of, of, of those who are searched are black, as opposed to, again, let me remind you of the percent in the population. 43% are, are, are actually searched. And then you look at the rates of over-policing and we see that 11.7% are, um, that's, that's the average search rate and the citations issued begin matching this, this, over, this, this overage and stoppage and being searched. But you ask, well, what do they find? Maybe it's because they're, they're, they're finding things. And this is the contraband hit rate. This is when you actually find something. Pretty much what, what has been established nationwide is that there's not much difference. Even though you're stopped far more many times, the actual hit rate is about the same as it is between black and white. And these are the actual numbers. Um, away from those percents that we looked at earlier. So we're talking in APD, there are three black women who are police officers and 12 black men. And here we are with the daily population. This is a snapshot of the Buncombe County detention facility. Um, and again, you can see it by race, that 28% of those who are held versus 6% of the total population. And if you break it by gender, it's even more skewed. Number of felonies that are uh, arrested. And I think that's the end of it. Yeah, and that's the end of the show. I'm, I'm really happy to, to uh, I'm sorry for rushing through justice like I did and for healthcare, but I thought we should spend time on, on, on economic development, on economic mobility, as particularly as it uh, was related to housing. But I'm happy to answer questions or engage a conversation with you now. <laughs>